Russian forces are bombarding the last remaining strongholds in the eastern part of Ukraine. The mayor of one city in the Donbass region says 1,500 people have been killed and more than 60 percent of the residential buildings destroyed. Meantime, Ukrainian President Zelensky is calling out the European Union, which has yet to agree on a six aid package for the country. Zelensky says every delay comes at the expense of innocent Ukrainian lives. CBS News foreign correspondent Deborah Pata joins us now from Kyiv. Deborah, thank you for being with us. Can you give us the latest on the eastern Donbass region first? What is the situation like on the ground right now? Well, what we're seeing in the east of this country, in the Donbass region, is the intensification of the fight there. And after weeks of a bloody stalemate, Russia has made significant advances for the first time in that region, coming down um, in full force. As you know, Mariupol has already fallen, and now it looks as if they've taken the town of Lehman. The Ukrainian officials have also conceded that, that it has probably gone to Russia, and they've completely encircled Sierra Donetsk and going after another area in that particular region in Luhansk. Um, so really the fight is on for the first time some serious advances by Russia and Ukraine saying that they're battling and that without more heavy weaponry, serious artillery, the kind that can fight this advance, they are struggling in that region. Deborah, why is this region, this specific region, so important to Russia? Well, for two things. First of all, as you know, Vladimir Putin's war, the goals of that war have been shrinking ever since this invasion began. In the beginning, there was an invasion all out in the country. They were going to seize the capital, Kiev. There was possibly going to be regime change. That didn't happen. They didn't win Kiev. Even in Kharkiv, the second largest city, Russian troops have been pushed back towards the border. That city is near the Russian border and a very important part um, of the country for Russia because it is so close and a way in which they can get troops in and keep the pressure on there. But they're, they're under pressure there as well. So the Donbass region is really where they could declare some kind of victory. So if they're able to push forward and seize more territory than what they already have, the, the Russian-backed separatist-controlled areas is only a small part at the moment um, of that region. If they could seize more of it, then they could declare some kind of victory. Why do they want that area? Well, it's near Crimea, and they want to create some kind of land bridge between Crimea and Donbass, and in that way have complete control over the two areas. And they'd also be able to block Ukraine off from the Black Sea, which is such an important trade area for this country. Absolutely. And Deborah, on another note, you're leaving Ukraine tomorrow mm -hmm. after reporting there for over a month. We have learned so much from your insightful and incredible reporting. Uh, what has stood out to you in particular? For me, it's always the people. You know, war is not only about explosions and tanks and how much weapons and heavy artillery and that kind of thing. Obviously, those things matter when you're in the battlefield and we report on the battle. But war is about the people, about the people whose lives have been shattered because behind every obliterated building, and we've seen destruction on a massive scale in this country, there are people whose dreams have been completely crushed. There are people like the man we met in Saltivka, whose home was absolutely destroyed. We went inside, it was an apartment block, and the entire inside had been taken out. It was just an empty shell. His life was there. He grew up there. He was born there when he was very, very young. And his own children, now that he's married, have been born there. He's got nothing left. He has no idea what he's going to do. All he's left with are two cups. He has to rebuild his life. We met a young child, an eight-year-old boy, who was trapped in an underground bunker for 84 days when we met him. And when he first moved there with his mother, they were staying with other people um, from their area, he would draw these cheerful, happy, normal childlike pictures, sunny skies, happy homes, beaches, birds in the sky. Now, when we met him, he was only drawing monsters and tanks. He couldn't talk about the trauma, but his pictures really spoke volumes. And a little girl we met who was fleeing from Bakhmut, who had to make an adult decision at the age of seven to try and understand why she had to 
leave stuff behind, had to make that choice. And I asked her, you know, what did you bring? She said, I left almost everything. And all she had was a little stuffed toy duck. These mm. are the kinds of people, their, their trauma, I think, is felt. And, and that's what we understand in war, the people whose, whose husbands, whose children have died, civilian deaths in a war um, that should never have happened in the first place and who have now lost the people they love and have to bury them. Um, sometimes in one instance we saw a woman who had to bury her husband twice. He was killed in shelling um, by Russian tanks, his body exhumed by prosecutors for a war crimes investigation, and then the fresh grief all over again as they buried him a second time. And for me, I think these are the kinds of images and the stories that will continue to haunt me. These are the faces, in a sense, of this war. Deborah, you have uh, managed to give us a piece of a, of a nation that many of us didn't know about. Um, you've painted a picture for us that we will never forget. Deborah Potter, your reporting has been tremendous. Thank you.